All right, welcome back. Happy Wednesday. Today we cover factoring trinomials. Um, on Friday it's more about factoring and then Monday is our quest and the good news for you is that the quest is not on anything we're doing today or Friday. So the last class that we had on Monday, that was the end of the material for the quest. Um, in terms of preparing for the quest, there are sample quest problems in the packet. I'll show you where and how to find the videos in a little bit today. Any questions on the calendar? So yesterday was advising day. Raise your hand if you came in for advising day. Well, that's pretty good. It's about half of us. Excellent. And did everybody get registered yesterday that came in? Yeah, super. Good, good, good. So even if you didn't come in yesterday, this is still a great time to meet with your advisor. So go to their office door, and they probably have a schedule hanging outside where you can fill in your name and meet with them sometime to register. Okay. And again, for the next two weeks, starting now, the only people who can register are current GCC students. But in mid-April, new incoming GCC students also get to register, and that's a much bigger pool of people. So right now, classes are generally wide open. So see if you can uh, get your ideal schedule by registering early. All right, so uh, there was this problem here that probably uh, not all that many people had a lot of time to think about. I might project it again right before class on Friday. But um, this is a problem from an AccuPlacer sample test. And uh, it just seemed appropriate because it has a lot to do with uh, simplifying radicals that we've been talking about. So um, raise your hand if you got an answer. Did anybody get this one? Yeah, I think it was just the one person that had time to look at it. So we can um, check this one out maybe right before class on Friday. If we have time, I'll project it again today. But I want to make sure we get through the new stuff, which is on page 27. So, so, so. Um, let's uh, begin with number one here, Mariah. In the middle of page 27. Okay, great. Uh, number two, we'll go to Abby. Polynomials. Okay, so there's uh, way more here than we need to do. Let's just try G right now. So go ahead and multiply those two things together, either the lobster claw or the box method, distribute everything, or I guess FOIL if you're so inclined, and then simplify your answer when you're done. How are we doing on this? A lot of people are still writing. What are we writing? I guess if you draw a box, it takes a while to, to get the thing set up. But ultimately, we need to get to x squared plus 7x minus 44. Any questions on that? Anybody get anything different? Yes. What did we do? What did we get? Yeah, so far so good. Keep going. You gotta multiply these two guys and put it there at the end, and then just combine those, and you'll oh. you'll get what we have. Sweet. Okay, so so so. Uh, here are some observations that we made last class. If you take this number, I'm thinking of that as not being adding 11, but it being a positive 11, and this number right here, which I'm not thinking of as a, as a subtraction, I'm thinking of as a negative four, and you multiply them together, what do you get? We get negative 44 which happens to be sitting right there. So what happened? I thought we changed colors. So um, this guy and this guy have a product of negative 44. Everyone buy that? So the product ends up in that last spot. And if you add the two numbers I've circled in purple, positive 11 plus negative 4, what do we get? positive 7, which happens to be right there. So I can say that 
the sum of the two numbers is that positive 7. And it turns out this is true all the time when we're multiplying x plus a number times x plus a number. It's okay if some or both are minuses. But it works every time like that. So the product is the last guy and the sum is the middle guy. And we wrote that down last time. And that's going to help us in going in the harder direction. So let's try um, number four. Uh, we'll go to Boo. Okay, so the goal is to take that thing and figure out what it came from. Two sets of parentheses that got multiplied together, and we get x squared plus 9x plus 14. Megan, number five. Okay, so we know that the product is supposed to be that number, right? And the product of some of two numbers is supposed to be positive 14. So give me two numbers that multiply together and give positive 14. Could be positive 7 and positive 2. Or so I'm going to write 1 and 14. Actually, I told a lie here. I mean, we could have done negative 7 and negative 2, and negative 1 and negative 14. So there's really four choices. But... Um, if I insist everything's positive, then those are the only two pairs of numbers that work. And what I'd like you to do is just multiply these guys out. So go ahead and, and do your double distributive on the first set of parentheses and do the, the double distributive or lobster claw on the second parentheses. And let's see what we get. Okay, so for the first one, I have x squared plus 9x plus 14. And the second one, x squared plus 15x plus 14. Is that okay? Any questions on getting those? So which was the one that worked, meaning which was the one that gave us this guy? So in our case, it was the first one, right? x plus 7 times x plus 2. No surprise. Uh, the product of the two red numbers here, 7 and 2, what's the product? 14, which is the last number. What's the sum of those two numbers? 9, which is that middle number. So that's the winner. And this is the harder direction. Um, okay, so let's go to the next page. And we'll take a look at number 6 for Kyle. Okay, so the first thing I want us to do is I want us to circle that last number and write the word product right above it. And this is something that with practice you'll get the hang of, but at the moment, basically, I'm just asking you to memorize. That last number is always supposed to be the product. Every single time we do this, that last number is the product. So we are thinking about numbers whose product is 12. Well, there are three different sets of numbers, again, assuming everything's positive. So uh, somebody tell me one pair of numbers that multiply to 12. One and 12. That's one possibility. Somebody else give me a different pair of numbers. Three and four. Somebody else a different pair of numbers. Two and six. Here are the possibilities, yes? So we factor all, uh, factor the number 12 in as many ways as possible. Now you could go through and distribute or lobster claw or foil or whatever you do and just do each one until you get the one that works, meaning gives us the 13x in the middle. But we remember now that uh, this 13 is always supposed to be sum of the two numbers. The end is the product, the middle guy is the sum. So just looking at these numbers I've written in blue here, what's the sum of these two numbers? 13, the sum of these two? 7, these two gives me 8, which is the one that we wanted. The first one, this 13, because I wanted it to be x squared plus 13x plus 12. 
So that's it. That's your winner. Okay, let's go to Karen for number seven. Okay, so the one that we just did was factoring x squared plus 13x plus 12. And here we were looking for two numbers, the kinds of numbers like in blue up here, whose product was 12 and whose sum was 13. That's what it says there, right? Product is 12, sum is 13. Here's a different example, the first one we did. To factor x squared plus 9x plus 14, we want two numbers whose product is what? 14 and whose sum is 9. Now, notice that I'm not saying whose sum is 9 and whose product is 14, which is true. I'm always starting at the end there because I don't want you to focus on numbers that have a certain sum. I want you to start by thinking about numbers that have a product. If I just say give me two numbers that add up to 9, 1 and 8, 2 and 7, 3 and 5, 3 and 6, 4 and 5, there's a lot of numbers that add up to 9. And if we're allowed to have negative numbers, then I could say like 11 and negative 2, right? There's so many numbers that add up to 9. But how many nice numbers multiply to 14? Not many, right? Do you understand why I'm, I'm putting the focus over there? Like you could do it left to right. That's quite natural. But it's not the right way to go. It's not the best way to go. You want to focus on the product, which is sitting at the end, and then find the one that has the right sum. So let's fill in the blanks here. To factor x squared plus 12x plus 20, we seek two numbers whose product is. Fill in a number right there in that first blank. And whose sum is, fill in another number. What's the product supposed to be? It's positive 20. Put a positive sign in front. And whose sum is supposed to be? Positive 12. Everybody see where we get those? It's always in that order. The last number is the product. The middle number is the sum. If you can keep that straight, today is easy. OK, so let's actually try this one. We're going to fill in this table to help us factor the one that we just looked at, x squared plus 12x plus 20. And we're going to fill in the beginning of this table first. Again, we want two numbers whose product is positive 20. And I'm going to keep writing those plus signs in the front. And whose sum is positive 12. Now here's my recommendation for doing this. There always has to be a miracle that happens for you to find these two numbers. It's just, it's just like happens. It falls in your lap. It's like didn't work, didn't work. Ah, finally we got it. And there's not really a lot of thinking involved. It's just something where you, you need to try enough possibilities until you land, you happen to land on the right one. So you don't need to think about both of these things together. What I'd like you to do is completely ignore the 12 for right now. Just focus on the product. There's not that many numbers that multiply to 20, for example positive 1 and positive 20. Notice I put the plus signs. Somebody else give me numbers that multiply to 20. 5 and 4 is fine. I'm not going to write that next. I want to do this in an orderly way where I start with a 1 and then I try a 2 and 2 goes in how many times? Product is 20, so we need 10. All right, the next number is 3. Does 3 go into 20? No. So then we get to 4. 4 goes in how many times? 5 times. The next number would be 5. Does 5 go in? It goes in 4 times, but there's no reason to write 5 and 4. It's the same as 4 and 5, and then we're done. You, you can keep going. You could get to 10 and 2, but it's equivalent to the 2 and the 10. So we've listed all the possibilities to get us a positive 20. Again, that's slightly a lie, because if all these numbers were negative, it would still give positive 20. It's OK. Everything is positive for right now. And all we're going to do is find the sum of each pair of numbers. What's the sum of 1 and 20? Positive 21. Just fill in the sum of the other two. That's positive 12. That's positive 9. Erica, did you have a question? Yeah, you can include negative numbers, um, and we're going to need negative numbers soon enough. Uh, right now, I'm starting with the easiest kind, where all the numbers up here at the start are positive. Yeah. OK, so there's our table. We needed numbers whose sum was positive 12. 
we found those numbers right here. Right? That was the one that gave us positive 12 in the middle. And so that means that x squared plus 12x plus 20, I'm just recopying the original, it's exactly the same as the product of two things. Why well, we start with two empty parentheses? And then I put x, and I put x. And then those numbers that we highlighted over here in yellow, those are our winners. So we just have to put them in here. The order doesn't make any difference. I'll put plus 2 in the first parentheses, plus 10 over here, and it's done. Um, okay, so uh, in terms of the quest, so these guys are not going to be on Monday's quest, just repeating that, right? But it will be on the next one. Um, uh, ultimately, you're going to need to write this. I, I think it'll just be like a blank line. It says put your answer in the blank line. Okay, any questions about the process? All right, so here's the deal. Do I need you on a quest to make this big table? No, I just need you to get to x plus 2 times x plus 10. So if you can do this whole product sum business in your head, totally fine. But I'm giving you a step-by-step -step procedure that you can follow every time, and it will get you there in an orderly fashion. And I recognize some people in this room have this miracle much faster than others. And some people can just say, oh, product is 20, sum is 12, it's a 2 and a 10, whereas the rest of us are just sitting there, you know, kind of like scratching our heads. Where did those numbers come from? So here's a way to get there, even if you don't have like super strong intuition about getting there. But I don't need to see any of this. Ultimately, just need to get to the answer. All right, let's try. Uh, why is this exactly the same? Well, that's curious, isn't it? Okay, so apparently I really like. What am I doing here? Let's fill in the table. Help us factor. Oh, oh the factoring is what we did right here. That's that's the answer. Okay, and then uh, here in number nine, it says to help you remember this product and some stuff, think of writing a PS at the bottom of a letter, not that there's a lot of letter writing happening these days, but PS goes at the end, right? Um, but you gotta make sure you put it backwards. <clears throat> P for product, S for sum, but it goes right to left. Product is always at the end, sum is always in the middle. Okay, so there are three examples here. I don't think we need to do all three. Let's just try part B. So even if you're really good at factoring, can you um, humor me and fill in a table here? We want two numbers whose product is what? 24, and include that positive sign. And we want the sum to be positive 11. And then we start listing. Megan, is that all right? Product at the end, sum in the middle. Um, so we want two numbers whose product is 24. And again, I encourage you to list them in an orderly fashion, starting with one. One times what? Yeah, so positive one times positive 24. That's the first way we can get 24. Next one I would try is two. Does two go into 24? 12 times, and then keep going. Does three go in? Does four go in? Does five go in? And you just go all the way down until you end up repeating something you've already written, and then you can stop. You don't have to ever write the same numbers in the reverse order. So we should have four different pairs of numbers in this case. And how do I know I'm done when I get to 4, 6? What's the next thing to try? Oh, we will add them after uh, one, in a second. Everybody understand that? 5 is the next number. It doesn't go in. 6 is the next one. It goes in, but it's the same as 4, 6 reversed. So we've got our complete list here. Now we're going to go through this business about finding the sum. So find the sum of each of these pairs of numbers, just fill them in. 
and you're hoping to find one whose sum is 11. That's the magic sum in this problem. What are the numbers that give us that magic 11 in this case? This is the positive 3 and the positive 8. So the last thing to do, start with our empty shell, two parentheses every time. X is in the front every time. And then the numbers that worked, the two numbers that gave us the product and the sum that we wanted. So plus 3 here, plus 8 here, totally fine to reverse those, and we have our answer. Questions on that? Okay, so let's pause for just a minute about this product sum business. Uh, two quick announcements. So first one, actually they're both about the quest that's coming up. So again, Monday is our quest. Uh, the first announcement, this quest is non-calculator. The entire quest is non-calculator, which means that um, since you'll be taking the quest in this room, you're probably going to want to look up at the perfect cubes that are over here in green and the perfect squares that are in uh, yellow, and or use the perfect powers reference sheet, which you can bring in to help you on the quest, all right? So I think we've, we've spent enough time practicing with that reference sheet so we can use it, but if you're not comfortable with that reference sheet, make sure that you have it around while you're practicing for the quest. Don't use a calculator while you're preparing. It's not going to help you. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that there are, again, practice uh, quest materials. We're just a few pages away, here they are. Starts on page uh, 32 in the packet. Bunch of practice problems for the quest. Again, at bare minimum, as you study for that quest, you should be doing these problems. I'm hoping you do a lot more than these problems, but bare minimum before Monday. Make sure you do these problems and you know how to do all of them. And again, on Moodle, you will find um, a full color solution, not just the answers, but the solutions to all of these problems. And also on YouTube, you will find videos of me going through each of these problems, and it tells you right here exactly how you're supposed to find the videos. Just have to type in the right search phrase, and my video will pop up. There's also a playlist available on um, Moodle if you feel like logging in there. And uh, somebody, uh, one of my students came up to me yesterday and said, hey, it was really uh, useful to practice with these exponents. Exponents are hard. And um, he said that the videos for these practice problems were really useful to him because these were just no nonsense. We're just going to do the problems and we're not going to, we're not developing anything. And it's just like straight start to finish. And he said it really clarified some stuff for him. So I encourage you to check out the videos for these as you work through the problems. Victor. Yes, uh, I don't know if there are any of those here. Do you see any on this page? Yeah, uh, I think I know the, the kind you're talking about. Um, something like, uh, uh, I don't know, um, was it, so you'd have like a power up here and the power would be 0.75. Yeah, um, so I don't know what was in the parentheses, but the idea with these is that 0.7, I, I don't know what to do with a decimal. I could handle it if it were a fraction, so let's make it a fraction. 0.75 is what fraction? Is three fourths. So you might just happen to know that. This is another one of those miracle things. You can just know it's three fourths. And then as soon as it's a fraction, now we're in familiar territory. Fraction power to me means radical. Parentheses is here. Where does the three go? It's, it's, it's the exponent. You could either put it inside or outside. It's up to you. And then the four. Is the index and yeah 0 0.04 so something like this well uh, there's a process and it might not be as familiar but there is a process to make 0 0.04 into a fraction like if you were to read this thing out loud but don't say it is 0 0.04 can anybody read this number to me that's four somethings it's four hundredths. Do we know that? 
This first slot right here is called what? Tenths, and the next slot is the hundredths, and the next one is the thousandths. So if I hear you say four one-hundredths, I immediately visualize a fraction where you're saying four pieces of a hundred, four hundredths. That's the fraction. So you can convert any decimal into a fraction by doing this process. Just read the thing out loud, and then you know, you'd reduce this. So this is 1 over 25, and that is the 25th root of something. Yeah, that's a good question, because we didn't do any uh, decimal ones, but that's, that's the idea. Thank you, Victor. OK, so that's the stuff about the quest. Let's come back to our factoring business. So we're here at the top of page 29. Okay, and we'll go to Yurka for number 11. Okay, so first one, fill in the product and the sum, positive numbers and negative numbers, put those signs in. What's the product in this case? Positive 4. And the sum is negative 5. OK, so let's go through this the same way we did before. And again, if you're one of those like instant miracle type persons, and I apologize, it's a little, it's going to be slow. This is going to feel slow for you. But I think I'm speaking to most people when I go through this process. So two numbers that multiply to positive 4. Could be positive 1 and positive 4. What's the other possibility? 2 and 2. And 3 doesn't go in, and we're done. So we've listed them all. Notice there's still some space left over. We're going to fill in. But let's just add them up and see what happens. What do we get when we find the sum in the first one? Positive 5. And in the second one? Positive 4. Did either one of those give me the sum that I wanted? The answer is no. But this is where we have to fix the lie that we were told earlier today, where I said these are the only numbers that multiply to 4. I could just as well make them all negative, and they still multiply to the same positive 4. So we need to do that here. Negative 1 and negative 4, negative 2 and negative 2. So for the first time now, we need to incorporate some uh, possibly negative numbers into our list. And when we add up the first one, what do we get? That's negative 5. That's going to be our winner, adding up the last row. Negative 4. And those right there are the numbers that add up to the negative 5. That's what we wanted. And that means we can write our final answer down here at the bottom. Two parentheses, x and x. And then what numbers go in? Negative 1 and negative 4. Questions on that? Okay, and just one observation, if, um, if you're on board with all this, here's something that's a little bit more advanced. If you get positive 5 and you really wanted negative 5, then the immediate thing to do is just change the signs on both numbers over here. So you don't have to go through this whole process. If you stumble on the right answer but it's the wrong sign, positive 5, but we wanted negative 5, you can stop the kind of trial and error process, the, the complete listing, and just say, oh, the right answer is positive 1 and positive 4, but change both those signs, negative 1 and negative 4. That's our answer. OK, let's take a look at part B. Uh, product equals negative 8. Sum equals positive 2. OK, for the first time, the product is supposed to be a negative number. That means I need a positive times a negative. So for example, positive 1 times what? 
negative 8, positive 2 times negative 4. Does 3 go in? No, does 4 go in? Yes. Uh, so positive 4 and negative 2. But didn't I say we don't have to repeat? Are those the same pair of numbers? They're different. Positive 2 and negative 4 is a different set of numbers than positive 4 and negative 2. you got to include them here. You never have to repeat the same numbers, but these are different sets of numbers. Uh, let's see, what's the last number that goes into negative 8? Yeah, so positive 8 with negative 1. Okay, I think that's our whole list. So let's just start adding them up and see what happens. So when we add the first row, negative 7, second row, negative 2, third row, 2, which is positive 2, and the last row, positive 7. What were we hoping for? Positive 2, which we found right here. That's our positive 2. So empty parentheses, X is in both. And what are the two numbers that we put in? Negative 2 and positive 4 in either order. It's fine. Questions on that? So again, this advanced thing that I said before, as soon as you get negative 2, you say, wait a minute, that's the right answer, but it's the wrong sign. It should have been positive 2, right? So what did I say? If you get negative 2, but you want a positive 2, what do we do with these numbers? We change their signs. So the positive 2 changes to a minus 2, minus 4 changes to plus 4, and that's the winner. So again, the way that I do this, not the way that I'm teaching you to do this, but the way that I do this is I list my numbers, but as soon as I list a pair of numbers, I immediately do the sum, hoping that I'll just get lucky sooner rather than later. But if I get to a sum, which is the right answer, but the wrong sign, I stop and I say, oh, just got to change the signs on the original numbers and we're done. Questions on this one? Okay, um, so I think that's fine. We can skip over part C. Let's take a look at number 12. I will go up here to Lauren. Okay, so let's look at x squared plus 4x plus 12, which looks pretty similar to all the other ones we've done today. It's going to turn out this one isn't going to be factorable. And there's nothing, like, you can't just look at it and say, oh, this is different. It looks the same as all the other ones we did today. So we'll fill in the product sum business as usual. Product is supposed to be positive 12. Sum is supposed to be positive 4. And then we list the factors of positive 12, starting with 1 and 12. And then we calculate the sum in all three rows. What happened? None of them added up to four. We didn't do anything wrong. It's just that the, the potential pairs there were these three, none of them happened to add up to four. So what does that mean? It just means the thing isn't factorable. And like Lauren just read, most of them are not factorable. So the ones that we do it make it seem like everything is factorable, but it's really the, it's the odd ones. It's the, 
it's the outliers that are factorable. Most of them are not. So your answer for this one is just uh, not factorable, not factorable, or. Um, so we know that, for example, uh, 14 is really 7 times 2, right? You can factor 14. Can you factor um, like the number 13? What's the only way to factor the number 13? There's 1 and 13, which really isn't accomplishing anything. So what do we call such a number where you can't factor it at all, except in the like, trivial way? It's prime, right? You guys have heard that word before. 13 is a prime number because you can't factor it. Uh, people know the word prime much better than they know the antonym. Anybody know what 14 is called because you can factor 14? Starts with a C. Is it? Yeah, people don't know this word as much. I will let Morgan think about it for just a moment. Um, so then uh, thinking back to our x squared plus 4x plus 12, turns out you can't factor it. What do we call something you can't factor? Yes, but what did we call 13? Because we couldn't factor it. We call it prime. So just as well, we can use exactly the same vocabulary to say that uh, this thing up here is prime. You just can't factor it. Composite. 14 is called composite. Composite. Anybody know this guy? Close. The thinker. Anybody know who made the thinker? Apparently it's some company in China, but uh, the original sculptor? It's Rodin made the thinker, so we'll uh, hear for her accomplishment with coming up with the word composite. You can watch over the thinker today. Okay, um, so uh, just like we said down here, uh, we say that the thing is either not factorable or uh, prime. Either way is fine. Okay, so just some uh, general observations about these things. So now I'm looking at uh, like as, a, as general a thing as possible. Ax squared plus bx plus c, where a, b, and c are just any old numbers. So first of all, if a is equal to 1, like every example we did today, every example we did today started x squared plus something or x squared minus something, but they were all 1x squared. If a is equal to 1, then we seek two numbers whose product is c and whose sum is b. Isn't that what we said? Product is that guy, sum is that guy. That's what we've done. If c is positive, that's this number at the end, there are two different ways to multiply a pair of numbers and get something positive. What kinds of numbers can you multiply and get a positive thing? Two positives or two negatives. So as soon as you have C being a positive number, then the two numbers that we seek are both the same sign as B. Whatever that sign is in the middle, you're looking for two numbers like that. Let's make that concrete by looking at uh, an example we've already done today. Um, this guy right here was a positive number. That little observation says that we are looking for two numbers that are the same sign as that one in the middle. So two positive numbers were supposed to be the final answer. Was it? They're here in blue, positive 2 and positive 10. If the last number is positive, like the plus 20, then the two numbers you're after are both the same sign, and they're the same sign as the middle number, positive 12 in this case. Uh, was that true down here in part B? Again, the last number was positive, so we want two numbers that are the same sign as the middle number, both positive in this case, plus 3 and plus 8. Then we came into something with a negative, like part A here. The last number was what kind? Positive. So we want two numbers that are both the same sign as this middle guy, both negative. Is that what we ended up with in our answer for this? Down here in green, both negative numbers. Uh, okay, so that's where uh, the last thing, thing is positive. Jumping back down here to part C. If C is negative, then the two numbers we seek have opposite signs. 1 plus and 1 minus. Was that the case here in part B at the top? The final number up here, negative 8, that was negative. So we seek one positive number and one negative. In green, one positive, one negative. 
Okay, and then finally part D, if A is not one, for example, three X squared plus something, something, then good luck. They're a lot harder and we'll tackle them next class. Um, but for right now, we're always gonna have a one in the front. Those are the easier ones. So you don't need to memorize those things, but with some practice, they should start to become more and more clear that they're true. And um, knowing these kinds of things will help you. Um, it will save you time as you go through your trial and error with the table, All right? Okay, so uh, group activity is all about factoring. So there's this page, and then on the next page, three more, and then an answer key. But instead of looking at the answer key first, maybe check in with your neighbors as you work on these, and I'll walk around and help.